Okay, I'm going to comment on uh, some uh, recent discussions about uh, interest rate policy uh, using uh, as a, the framework of a paper that uh, I recently wrote with uh, Aaron Guzzi and Seppo Honkapoya, uh, which was published in the European Economic Review in 2008. Uh, so the current situation is this. We've got uh, interest rates at near zero levels, so the Treasury bill rate and the federal fund rate is close to zero, and inflation is hovering around deflation. Uh, sometimes we think we have positive inflation, sometimes it looks like zero, sometimes it looks like mild deflation. And an issue that's recently come up is whether uh, it would be uh, wise to, in view of the Fisher relationship, to actually increase uh, nominal interest rates, short-term uh, interest rates, uh, in order to push the economy out of deflation. Uh, so, well, in my view, that uh, policy is, is uh, uh, incorrect. Uh, from an adaptive learning point of view, it's going to push the economy in the wrong direction. And so I just want to explain uh, why that is. Uh, now, there's, this ground has already uh, been covered in the past, actually, by an interesting paper by Peter Hallett uh, back in 1992. Um, in the Journal of uh, Political Economy, uh, he looked at economy with uh, a given uh, steady state and uh, with uh, uh, interest rate targeting, and he showed that uh, under learning uh, that, uh, that equilibrium was unstable. So uh, the, the particular framework I'm going to discuss now, summarize very quickly, is uh, a elaboration of that, if you like, uh, in, a, in a new Keynesian model. So we look at a model which is very directly relevant to the currency, current uh, policy situation. And uh, it's a model in which there are multiple equilibria. And under learning, we get uh, the possibility of uh, uh, unstable trajectories as one of the possible outcomes in the model. So, I'm going to go through it, and then I'll come back to that issue that I uh, talked about at the beginning and also talk briefly about other uh, policy implications. Uh, so the crucial framework here, the, we're, our starting framework, is actually a paper by Benedict Schmidt-Groy Uribe that was in the Journal of Economic Theory uh, in 2001, where they pointed out that if you have a Taylor rule uh, subject to a zero interest lower bound, uh, then you got um, uh, the possibility of multiple equilibria. Uh, so I'm going to summarize the whole argument in two diagrams. That's the first diagram. So let me show you that. Uh, here we've got the uh, Fisher line, pi over beta, uh, and an interest rate rule, which I've denoted Taylor rule. So here, uh, pi denotes the inflation factor. Uh, so uh, 1.02 would be a 2% inflation rate. Uh, there's some target. Uh, let's say it's uh, 1.02 for the inflation rate, or pi star, I've denoted it here. Uh, and the Fisher relation, here R, capital R is the uh, interest rate factor, so uh, an R of uh, 1.01 uh, means a 1% uh, net interest rate. And the Fisher relationship is an R equals pi over beta, where beta is the discount factor. Uh, that might be, say, 0.99, in which case uh, uh, beta inverse is uh, uh, 1.01 approximately. So I've drawn in the Fisher line, r equals pi beta, uh, pi over beta, and the Taylor rule, and I'm uh, drawn in the Taylor rule so that there's active monetary policy at the target, pi star, so that interest rates are raised uh, more than one for one with the uh, 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 changes in the inflation rate. And what Benedict schmidt roy Rebe pointed out was that uh, because of the zero interest lower bound, and here that corresponds with r equals one, uh, there's got to be another steady state, uh, and that would be at whatever the minimum interest rate is that policymakers choose. Here I've represented it as one below some uh, threshold uh, inflation level, uh, and at beta inverse, uh, which corresponds to a deflation rate of uh, whatever uh, beta inverse is. Uh, if it's, uh, it'll be one percent if beta is uh, approximately 0.99. Okay, so. Uh, so now let's have a look at uh, what happens in a new Keynesian model. So uh, in the work with uh, Seppo and Aaron Guzzi and a number of uh, related papers, uh, we, we looked at this under uh, learning dynamics 
where uh, the inflation rate, uh, uh, expected inflation and expected consumption, actually respond to the data over time. So if agents see uh, low inflation rates, they revise downward their uh, expected inflation rate. And if uh, they see uh, consumption levels that are uh, low, if they have low levels of the consumption, their expectations of future consumption are also low. So the, the model equations consist of a new Keynesian Phillips curve and a new Keynesian IS curve. Uh, by using the framework of uh, Benjamin Schmidt-Groy and Uribe, we can actually do this in a global setting. Uh, so that we can retain uh, both of the equilibria, the one that the monetary policies are really targeting, and another equilibrium, the unintended equilibrium, that corresponds to the zero lower bound. Uh, so the model equations consist of a new Keynesian Phillips curve. These are nonlinear equations, and I'm not going to write down the details of the new Keynesian Phillips curve, except to say it behaves in the way you might expect. Inflation depends on expected inflation and it depends on um, uh, measures of aggregate economic activity, uh, consumption, and uh, output, which in this uh, plain vanilla New Keynesian model is just consumption plus government spending. So uh, inflation is a forward-looking equation that depends on inflation expectations in this usual way. And there's also a New Keynesian IS curve, which basically is just the uh, Euler equation that comes from household uh, decision-making. I should mention that uh, Sefal Honkapoy and I have looked at other versions of the framework uh, which, have, uh, which have a kind of infinite horizon to expectations. I'm giving you the simplest version right here. So consumption depends on expected uh, consumption next period and on the discount factor, beta, and on the ex-ante real interest rate, RT over pi t plus 1. So that's the model. The model is a new Keynesian Phillips curve, a new Keynesian IS curve based on the household Euler equation, adaptive learning for expectations, and uh, this model can be studied uh, by just looking at the expectational dynamics and represented, because it's two-dimensional, in a phase diagram, and here it is. This is, this is what happens under adaptive learning. Uh, there's the targeted steady state, pi star. Let's say it's 2%, so pi star is 1.02, and there's a corresponding level, uh, steady state level of consumption and of, and of output. Uh, I've chosen consumption on the axis here. There's another steady state. That's the unintended equilibrium, and it corresponds to the other intersection uh, in the Fisher equation. So, uh, so there we have it, and when you map out the expectational dynamics under learning, uh, you, you get the phase diagram shown here. And the first thing you notice is that the targeted city state is stable under learning. Well, I should say locally stable under learning. So any point in here, if you give me initial expectations that are, say, at this point here, following the phase diagram, you can see it converges into the targeted city state. So the Taylor rule works locally. But what if you have a pessimistic shock to expectations? Suppose you have financial meltdown. Everybody becomes pessimistic about their future consumption and about future expectations. Well, if the shock is not too large, the Taylor rule still does the job and you converge into the targeted steady state. But if the shock is really quite large, so it puts you at the position of that red dot right here, then the path looks like this. And so this is what we call the deflation trap region. Uh, it's demarked by the uh, points to the southwest, I guess we call it, of the green dashed line there. In other words, the other equilibrium, the, the deflation uh, steady state uh, that, we've, that people have been talking about recently, is locally unstable under learning. It actually takes the form of a saddle, uh, but this is a bad saddle. This is not the kind of saddle that we're used to in the rational expectations set up where that's what we want. This is a bad saddle because Expectations could be anywhere uh, in, that, uh, in a region of that point. Uh, there are, there's a, a zero dimension line that con converges to that point. Uh, the arrows point inward along the uh, green dash line. Uh, if you're a little bit more optimistic than that, then actually you'll get to the targeted steady state eventually. But if you're more pessimistic than that in various directions, then uh, you actually get into a deflation trap region where inflation falls and eventually consumption and output fall over time as well. And the mechanism is very simple. 
the mechanism is, uh, imagine that you're at that uh, uh, the low inflation uh, steady state or deflation steady state, and suppose expectations are somewhat more pessimistic, then in terms of the new Keynesian Phillips curve, that's going to lead to lower levels of inflation. And in terms of the uh, uh, new Keynesian IS curve, the lower inflation raises the real interest rate, and the rate, higher real interest rate uh, lowers consumption. And that gets into a self-fulfilling feedback loop in which consumption and inflation uh, fall over time. Okay, so uh, let's turn now to the question of uh, would this uh, problem be allevi alleviated by increasing the interest rate uh, so, that, uh, so that we eliminate that deflation uh, equilibrium at an interest rate, a zero net interest rate, an interest rate factor of one, and beta inverse. So suppose, suppose we raise it. Suppose we raise it to some level uh, r hat. So I'm suggesting here now that uh, we consider the policy of, uh, let's suppose, okay, it depends exactly what happens, depends on where we are, but let's suppose we were at we, uh, the low inflation uh, or deflation uh, steady state. Uh, so I'm going to, um, of course, I've just argued that that's unstable under learning, but you don't have to be exactly there. You can be nearby or even far away in the wrong places, and the same argument will apply, but it's easiest for me to make the point I assume we're exactly at that point, and we now look at what happens if we increase interest rates. Well, if we increase interest rates, uh, then effectively, I'm assuming that we will go back to the Taylor rule if inflation is high enough. Uh, so if we increase interest rates, what's that going to do? Well, if you work out the details uh, under uh, the expectational dynamics, it turns out that you just push this curve uh, up. So the saddle point that divides the deflation trap region uh, to the stable region gets pushed up and to the right. And so what that means is that if you were at the uh, at the previous uh, uh, at the uh, deflation uh, steady state uh, and and sitting there, you're now pushed into the deflation trap region, and so you're going to get points now uh, that look like this. And so you're going to get pushed off into this deflation uh, spiral under, the, and, and because you're now in the deflation trap region. And in fact, so of course the details depend on where you are. Uh, where are we right now? Well, I don't know. Uh, but we could be uh, possibly, uh, as a result of uh, the policies that have been followed, we're not in quite such a bad place. Maybe we were uh, right here. Perhaps we were uh, on a trajectory that would have taken us back. Uh, to the, uh, to the uh, steady state that's targeted by policy, uh, but this now pushes us in to the uh, deflation trap region, and so instead of actually going back uh, to the equilibrium, we're now pushed into a position where we are going off again to uh, a deflation, further deflation and falling output. So uh, that's my argument uh, based on adaptive learning dynamics for uh, why not to increase interest rates right now. So what should we do? Uh, well, uh, there are a variety of possible policies that we could be following. Uh, one of them is uh, to commit to low interest rates for a longer period of time. Uh, another one would be uh, quantitative uh, easing. Uh, that's a policy that has been uh, recommended by uh, a number, or being considered by a number of people in the Fed. Jim Bullard has recently uh, been pushing this particular policy. Uh, that has the advantage that it gets uh, longer term interest rates down, and uh, there are a variety of other ways that quantitative easing could stimulate the economy, so that's certainly something that should be considered. Uh, in the European Economic Review paper uh, with uh, Aaron Guzzi and Seppo Honkapoya, uh, we actually argued for uh, fiscal policy as well. Uh, actually, what we argued was first you should pursue aggressive monetary policy. Now, that policy actually has been followed. Uh, I think we have to hand it to the Fed Open Market Committee that beginning in 2008, they dramatically reduced interest rates and uh, had interest rates near zero by the end of 2008. So that was step one for sure. Uh, step, a, a second step, uh, however, is that 
uh, it may be necessary to have aggressive fiscal policy. So we did follow expansionary fiscal policy in 2009. Uh, was that adequate for the task? I don't know. A number of people argued it was too small. At the moment it's beginning to look like maybe we should be doing more on fiscal policy as well. So that's certainly another dimension uh, to consider. As I say, we don't know exactly where we are. Uh, the, the aggressive monetary policy will have uh, expanded the zone of stability and reduced the deflation trap region, uh, but we really don't know whether we're in the deflation trap region or not. It could be that we're hovering around this low inflation or deflation uh, equilibrium or below it, uh, so it's entirely possible that we're at some point down in this region here uh, where inflation is hovering around deflation and consumption expectations uh, are low and we don't know whether we're in the deflation trap region in which we actually go off into a deflationary spiral in the future or whether past policy has been sufficient to bring us back but there's certainly plenty of room for more aggressive policy uh, in the near future. Okay. Thank you George. Thank you Mark.